study, the Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus, who wrote a work called The Annals of Rome around AD 115, and the Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote Jewish Antiquities around AD 95, they confirm that Jesus was crucified in Judea when Pontius Pilate was procurator. That was between 26, AD 26 and 36. So you have those sources uh, confirming that. The claim that Jesus never existed, this was first proposed at the end of the 18th century. That's a long time to go before somebody discovers that supposed truth. It was first proposed at the end of the 18th century by some disciples of the radical English deist named Lord Bolingbroke. New Testament scholars of all stripes do not take the claim seriously. For example, in his influential history of New Testament interpretation, a work titled The New Testament, The History of the Investigation of Its Problems, Werner Kummel, he addresses the claim only in a footnote. And he says, well, he says this thing's out. That's what he says. Oh, there we go. says the denial of the existence of Jesus is arbitrary and ill-founded. The famous German New Testament scholar, Gunther Bornkamm, in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, to doubt the historical existence of Jesus at all was reserved for an unrestrained, tendentious criticism of modern times into which it is not worthwhile to enter here. Willy Markson, who was another well-known New Testament scholar, he says, I am of the opinion, and it is an opinion shared by every serious historian that the theory that Jesus never lived is historically untenable. Dale Allison is a leading scholar on the life of Christ. He says, no responsible scholar can find any truth in the theory Jesus never lived. Craig Evans is another scholar with that same focus as Dale Allison on the life of Christ. And Craig Evans says, no serious historian of any religious or non-religious stripe doubts that Jesus of Nazareth really lived in the first century and was executed under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea and Samaria. Even Rudolf Bultmann, Bultmann, the famous, or perhaps I should say infamous, liberal German scholar, who, who doubted all kinds of things. He, he, Bultmann was somebody who doubted the authenticity of much of the Gospels, but even Bultmann says, of course, the doubts as to whether Jesus really existed, the doubt as to whether Jesus really existed is unfounded and not worth refutation. No sane person can doubt that Jesus stands as the founder behind the historical movement whose first distinct stage is represented by the Palestinian community. Noted historian Michael Grant, in his 1977 book, Jesus and Historian's Review of the Gospels, he termed the hypothesis that Jesus never lived as a, quote, extreme view, end quote. And he says, if we apply to the New Testament, as we should, the same sort of criteria as we should apply to other ancient writings containing historical material, we can no more reject Jesus' existence than we can reject the existence of a mass of pagan personages whose reality as historical figures is never questioned. He notes that the arguments for the Christ myth, the idea that Jesus never existed, have, have, he, he notes that they have been, quote, annihilated, end quote, by scholars because the critics, quote, have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant evidence to the contrary. Now the claim that Jesus never existed, this has been refuted so definitively that Robert Van Voorst declares in his book, Jesus Outside the New Testament, the theory of Jesus' non-existence is now effectively dead 
as a scholarly question. Even Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar who describes himself as an agnostic slash atheist. He kind of fuses the two together. So he describes himself as agnostic slash atheist. Even Bart Ehrman wrote a book trying to counter the nonsense that Jesus never existed. Nonsense that's on the internet. And Ehrman, he writes, he said first, the view that Jesus existed is held by virtually every expert on the planet. And he includes himself in that group. And then he adds, it is striking that virtually everyone who has spent all the years necessary to attain these qualifications as serious historians of the early Christian movement, because people who do this for a living, who have gotten doctorates in and who've spent their careers studying this, to have people take seriously what they judge to be nonsense is irksome to them. And so he writes this and says, uh, it's striking virtually everyone who spent all the years necessary to attain these qualifications is convinced that Jesus of Nazareth is a real historical figure. You see? So we have, Ehrman says that. We even have, uh, let me go here. I want to talk about another one of the groundless claims. So the first thing, the groundless claim I'm not going to spend time on is this idea that Jesus never existed. The second one I'm not going to spend time on is that Jesus did not die by crucifixion. Okay, you may run into this. I don't know. But I'm just now setting out, I'm not going to waste time other than to dispatch these right now quickly. Okay, I want you to know, yes, I'm aware of them, but they're not worth spending time on. The second one is Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. The fact Jesus died by crucifixion this is considered indisputable by almost all scholars writing on the subject. Crucifixion was, of course, it was a common form of execution employed by the Romans in Jesus' day against certain categories of offenders, including those accused of treason. And Jesus' death by crucifixion, it's attested by numerous ancient sources, Christian and non-Christian alike. It's all over the New Testament, including in letters Paul wrote no more than 25 years after the event. It's mentioned repeatedly in early non-canonical Christian writings, meaning writings by Christians that are not part of the New Testament. It's mentioned there, and it's very probably reported by Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century. I say very probably for a reason I'll explain to you later. But it's very probably noted by him. The Roman historian Tacitus, I already mentioned, who wrote in the early uh, second century, he was certainly aware of the event, as was the second century Syrian writer Lucian, the Syrian writer Mara Bar Serapian, who wrote sometime after A.D. 73, and very significantly, there is zero ancient evidence to the contrary. So not only do you have a sea of testimony that Christ died by crucifixion, you have no ancient evidence to the contrary. There is no claim or report of somebody disputing that, where somebody says, oh no, he didn't die that way. Or are there any reports or claims suggesting some alternate fate? So when you have Christian and non-Christian, all of this testimony and evidence, you know that the Romans crucified people that way, and you have zero evidence to the contrary, it's not worth messing with. Okay, it's not worth messing with. Michael Lacona, he offers the following quotes as reflecting the current state of scholarship on the question. Now, this is Lacona, and he's, this is from his book, and in here he's quoting some other people. John McIntyre comments, Even those scholars and critics who have been moved to depart from almost everything else within the historical content of Christ's presence on earth have found it impossible to think away the factuality of the death of Christ. McIntyre is quite correct. Atheist Gerd Ludemann writes, 
Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Crossan, that's John Dominic Crossan, he says, Crossan, who denies the authority of a large majority of the sayings and deeds attributed to Jesus in the canonical Gospels, comments that there is not the, quote, slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, and, quote, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be, end quote. For the Jewish scholar, Giza Vermes, the passion of Jesus is part of history, end quote. The rather skeptical scholar, Paula Fredrickson, writes, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. So this is another one of these grounds, uh, just groundless claims that I'm going, not going to spend a lot of time with. Bart Ehrman, the atheist slash agnostic, Ehrman says one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. And the Catholic scholar, Luke Timothy Johnson, who's certainly no fundamentalist, Johnson says the support for the mode of his death, its agents, and perhaps its co-agents is overwhelming. Jesus faced a trial before his death was condemned and was executed by crucifixion. Okay, so do you have people who would say some? Yes, they do, but in my judgment, they're just not worth messing with. Okay? So here are two groundless claims I dispense with. I now want to lay some groundwork. This is important groundwork. The views of death and afterlife at the time of Christ. Okay, how did the ancient, how did people in the ancient world think about these things? And this is a very important uh, idea because it plays into how we interpret some of the things that we'll be seeing. Now, some in the ancient pagan world, obviously there was diversity of beliefs. Some in the ancient pagan world, by that I mean non-Jewish, non-Christian, there were those in the ancient pagan world who denied there was any kind of life after death. In other words, they were of the worm food school. You die, that's it. So there were pagans like that. But most pagans, most pagans in the ancient world believe that a person's soul or spirit, the immaterial aspect of a human being, that it continued to exist after life. See, those pagans who believed in a continuing spiritual existence did not believe in resurrection, in the restoration of bodily life after death. See, for them, death was a one-way street to a disembodied existence. They believe the immaterial aspect, the soul or spirit of a human being, continued to exist. Some thought, no, death is the end. Other pagans thought, most pagans thought, the immaterial aspect continued to exist. But they did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in a bodily restoration of life. That's the pagan side of it. N.T. Wright He's probably the best-known theologian in the world today. Now, N.T. Wright, has, he's written many books. Part of a four-book series he wrote, one of them was a tome called The Resurrection of the Son of God. Now, N.T. Wright, he summarizes his research on the question, how did the ancient world view these things? He summarizes his research on that question in his 2008 book titled Surprised by Hope. And here's what Wright says. When the ancients spoke of resurrection, whether to deny it, as all pagans did, or to affirm it, as some Jews did, they were referring to a two-step narrative in which resurrection, meaning new bodily life, would be preceded by an interim period of bodily death. 
That's why he uses the phrase often, resurrection is life after life after death. You see, life after death, separation of body and spirit, resurrection is life after life after death. So he's saying here that, that, that uh, when ancients spoke of resurrection, they were referring to a two-step narrative in which resurrection, meaning new bodily life, would be preceded by an interim period of bodily death. Resurrection wasn't then a dramatic or vivid way of talking about the state people went into immediately after death. It denoted something that might happen, although almost everyone thought it wouldn't, sometime after that. This meaning is constant throughout the ancient world until the post-Christian coinages of second century Gnosticism. So it's not until you get into the Gnostics of the second century do you see this framework, them trying to use the terminology differently. Most of the ancients believed in life after death. Some of them developed complex and fascinating beliefs about it, which we have just touched on. But outside Judaism and Christianity, and perhaps Zoroastrianism, though the dating of that is controversial, they did not believe in resurrection. In content, resurrection referred specifically to something that happened to the body. Everybody knew about ghosts, spirits, visions, hallucinations, and so on. Most people in the ancient world believed in some such things. They were quite clear that that wasn't what they meant by resurrection. Resurrection meant bodies. We cannot emphasize this too strongly, not least because much modern writing continues most misleadingly to use the word resurrection as a virtual synonym for life after death in the popular sense. Okay, so this is the, this is the way ancients viewed things. Now, some Jews, like Sadducees, some Jews denied there was any kind of life after death. You had pagans, right? You had some pagans who denied there was any life after death. Well, you had some Jews who took that view. And those were Sadducees were included among them. And you had others, like the philosopher Philo, Philo the, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, first century Jewish philosopher. He believed one would continue to exist after death as a disembodied soul or spirit. So just as you had some pagans say you die, that's the end, but most pagans thought no, the non-material element would continue in perpetuity, but denied resurrection. So you had among Jews, Sadducees, you die, that's it. People like Philo, you die and you continue as a, in a disembodied state in perpetuity. So you had Jews like that, but most Ancient Jews, most ancient Jews believed that God would raise his people bodily from the dead at the last day, the day he judged and remade the world. You can see that belief clearly in Martha's statement in John chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. This is how, this is what most Jews thought. Is that there would be a group resurrection on the last day when God judged and remade the world. This idea is also evident in Paul's play to the Pharisees in Acts chapter 23, verse 6, that he was on trial with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead. You see, they shared that hope. They understood that. And it's evident in Paul's statement in Acts 24, 15, where that, he, where, that his accusers from Jerusalem, he says, they accept the hope that there will be a resurrection of the just and unjust. See, that was most Jews believe that. This is what they were expecting in several places. Jesus accepts this aspect of the standard Jewish view, the aspect of a general resurrection at the last day. For example, in Mark chapter 12, 
verses 18 to 27. And you can look in the parallels in Mark 22 and Luke 20. The Sadducees, when they ask him a trick question that was designed to make belief in an end-time resurrection look silly, he defended that belief by indicating that in, in that resurrection state, certain things would be different, so there would be no problem with people who were married multiple times in their pre-resurrection lives. And in Luke 14, verse 14, Jesus, in speaking of those who show kindness to those who are unable to repay them, he refers in the normal Jewish way to the resurrection of the righteous. Well, he's saying that in an environment where people understood, and this was the common Jewish understanding, that there would be this resurrection at the last day when God judged and remade the world. So Jesus accepts that in Matthew 13, 43. He refers to the end time resurrection through an allusion to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Now, that's what the Jews expected. What the Jews did not expect what they did not expect was that this end time resurrection, this rising to immortal life, we're not talking about resuscitation. We're not talking about where someone comes back to life still subject to death. You see that happening in history. We're talking about resurrection where one is raised immortal. You know, Romans chapter 6, verse 9, right? Speaks of Jesus is raised from the dead, and therefore death no longer has dominion over him. See, this is resurrection. We're not talking about resuscitation. What the Jews did not expect, they did not expect that someone would rise to immortal life, that there would be a resurrection, that this would happen to someone in advance of God's remaking the world. That wasn't part of their theological landscape. Their theological understanding and expectation was that when God comes and judges and remakes the world, there will be a group resurrection. What they did not expect was that someone prior to that time would be resurrected, raised to immortal life, not simply resuscitated. They expected everybody to be resurrected to immortality together in conjunction with the final judgment and the beginning of the eternal state. Now the fact Jesus was raised contrary to that expectation, raised immortal in advance of God's remaking the world, raised as the first fruits of the end time resurrection, it's indicated in Mark's account of the transfiguration. When Jesus told Peter, James, and John after the transfiguration not to tell anybody what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Well, Mark reports that they were puzzled about this rising, what this rising from the dead might mean. Now, you and I, standing at this side, we understand, and so does Mark writing the gospel, but he's letting us know that beforehand it was a puzzle. We say, what do you mean you don't know what he means? Well, they didn't understand the idea of a resurrection happening before the corporate or the group resurrection at the end time. God wasn't going to raise someone within history. He was only going to do that when he judged and remade the world. And so here you see this being reflected. R.T. France, who's a well-known New Testament scholar, he comments on this verse in his commentary. He says, if the disciples understood Jesus to be talking of his own individual restoration to life after death within the normal course of history, they had good reason to be bewildered as no clear precedent for such an idea can be found in extant literature of the period. This was not part of their theological landscape. N.T. Wright he says in his book, Resurrection of the Son of God, the passage, this passage I'm referring to in Mark, the passage flags up one of the points at which we have seen in our study of Paul 
a significant Christian innovation. You see, something that is unexpected within the Jewish framework. He says the idea that the resurrection has split into two, with Jesus' resurrection coming forwards into the middle of history. Mark clearly intends his readers to recognize that they share with hindsight the knowledge that Jesus seemed to have in advance. The reader understands what was for the disciples at the time still a puzzle. Mark is thus drawing our attention to the fact that this is precisely an innovation within Jewish thinking. You see this idea. Here are the diagrams. You've seen these from me in different times, but here I put them together to kind of show you. The first on the top, you see the Jewish expectation where you have the old age, you have the day of the Lord, this idea of God coming in judgment remaking, you have resurrection then, and then you have the eternal new age going on. Well, what has God done in Christ? I wish I had my pointer with me. This thing's got a laser on it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, hey. All right, so you see here, day of the Lord, this is when we go old age, new age, resurrection here. Well, what has happened is that resurrection in Christ has been pulled over. With, he, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. We are part of the same harvest, but now it's split in two that when he comes again, there will then be the general resurrection. But you have this thing. You see, and that's what, that's what they're saying. Well, what, what does this mean? That's what it meant. That's what it meant, and we understand that now. Here's what Frank Thielman in his book, uh, New Testament Theology, he says the resurrection of Christ is not an isolated incident. It is the first part of an eschatological, an end time scenario by which God will triumph finally over death. And that includes as a critical element the bodily resurrection of believers. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28, 42 to 57, and many other places. Without the resurrection of believers, the whole plan collapses and the resurrection of Christ becomes unnecessary. Without the resurrection of Christ, however, the gospel becomes nothing but a lie. In contrast, if Christ has been raised from the dead then he has begun to reverse the wave of death that has swept over humanity since Adam. His resurrection is the first resurrection of many others that will take place when Christ returns and God subjects all his enemies, including death, to him. He is the first fruits of our resurrection. It's all one harvest. He's the first fruits, but he has been pulled over into the now. You see, it's already begun in the resurrection of Jesus. And it will be finished when he returns. And then you have that expectation of that corporate and communal resurrection. You see, this is the idea. He has come here now, inaugurated the kingdom of God, his second coming, we have the, res the general resurrection, and then we have the eternal state where the world is remade, new heavens, new earth. Okay, so that's the innovation you see, and that's what puzzled people. That's part of the mystery that wound up puzzling the people. You see in 1 Corinthians, you see this very idea. It says, but in fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for died. Okay? The first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. See, so this is, this is what's happening. This is this innovation. This is a thing that's very important. Now, the fact the disciples were not expecting Jesus to be resurrected within history, despite what he told them. Sometimes we read that and say, how can they not know that? Well, they cannot know that because we're standing over here judging them, looking back. Because they're pre-cross, pre-resurrection. How can they not know that? It was puzzling to them. They didn't understand it. You see, but, but here, the fact that they weren't expecting him to be resurrected within history, 
despite what he told them, it's confirmed by their reaction to his death. You see, none of them said, look, don't worry about it. He'll be back in a few days. And no big deal. He, sure, he's dead. They crucified him. I heard that bell. Give me just a second. You know, he said, so don't worry about that. You know, you, you don't have to worry. None of them said that. You see, rather, their hopes were crushed. They went into hiding, and you can feel the despair in a statement by Cleopas, right? I won't read the whole thing, but you know he's talking to them about, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on here? And he says here, he says to the unrecognized Jesus on the road to Emmaus that what? They had hoped. They had hoped that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. The implication being, but they crucified him so he could not have been. We had hope. That was our hope. We were all jazz. We were waiting, hoping. But when we saw him dead, mm, that was a bust for us. Even the women, almost through. Even the women, see, when the women reported to the apostles and the others that the tomb was empty, the angels announced Jesus' resurrection, they didn't believe them. We wonder why. Well, this is why. It wasn't part of their theological landscape. They didn't understand that something was going to happen where you were going to have resurrection within history. That's this whole idea of Christ pulling. He brings the kingdom in, and we live in this overlap. They weren't expecting that. And so even all of these things, Thomas had everybody tell him that the Lord had risen, and he said he wouldn't believe him unless he could see the allegedly resurrected Jesus, that he had the distinguishing marks of the crucifixion, and he could feel the marks in the solidity of Jesus' body. It, the resistance was that strong. Now, I tell you all that, this will be important as we go forward. That's why I wanted to get it out and finish it. Next week, Ken, come back, enjoy. Two weeks, Lord willing, I'll be back. Thanks.